Hey everybody, is there anyone who doesn't speak Lithuanian in the room? Cool, so we're going to do it in English then, um, as, as planned. <laughs> um, so, hi everybody, my name is Odris. I am a founder of RDC Labs, that's uh, sort of a, my company. And today I'm going to talk about virtual reality, but first I want to quickly introduce myself. So, as a founder of a CEO of RDC Labs, I try to push the frontiers of virtual reality and build more um, interesting and new things in it and, and try and gather the community around virtual reality here in Lithuania. Previously worked as a developer and a consultant in different companies in the UK and I recently moved back to the lovely town of Vilnius. So I'm very glad to be here. It's actually my first time in login, so I think so far it's been a great conference. So my talk is called What's Next for Virtual Reality? So what's next for VR? And I really hope that after this presentation, every one of you will be able to answer the question, or this question to your friends. So what's next? What's going to be a next big thing in virtual reality and why is it important? So I'm going to give you a brief overview of new things that are coming in virtual reality and then focus a little bit more on games at the end of the presentation, just, just because we are in the game dev <laughs> room after all. Um, so first of all, what is virtual reality? How many of you have tried any sort of form of virtual reality? Could you raise your hands, please? So everybody tried virtual reality, great. <laughs> so it, this, this question might be um, easy to answer then. Um, so this is basically virtual reality today. For those who haven't tried it, this is an ad from Samsung just showing one of their devices that you probably <coughs> tried um, in this event. Um, so. A lot of people believe virtual reality is going to be the next big thing. Um, this is the quote for Mark Zuckerberg, and um, I, I agree with him. <laughs> I think in the long run, virtual reality is going to be a platform that's going to be equally important to all the other platforms that we have around. Um, however, a lot of people ask, you know, we have two very similar things. We have 3D cinema, we have 3D TVs, and we have VR, and what's the difference? They seem like they're basically the same thing, but there's one really important difference that differentiates them, and uh, that is called presence. Presence is a term used in virtual reality to describe the feeling that you're somewhere else, rather than the feeling that you get watching a 3D movie, which is just sensing the extra dimension of death. So the presence is an important aspect of virtual reality because, as this example shows here as well, like you wouldn't want to leap down the stairs from here, and it's true for virtual reality as well. It tricks your brain, it tricks your spinal cord, it tricks your nervous system into believing you're somewhere else, and you don't want to jump off that cliff. So, just to illustrate this example slightly more vividly, um, this is probably a video that you might have seen online from one of the Japanese VR shops. Um, people trying to do a simple exercise of uh, going on the board and uh, capturing a kitten at the other end. Um, but they, even though they know, they fully know where they are, they they can't control themselves or tell themselves not to be scared. So this is the real difference between true virtual reality and immersive experiences. Um, and, and, and to be honest, if you try something like that, it, like I, I can't force myself to jump off the cliff, even though I tried the VR headsets probably tens of thousands of times. So is it all just games, right? And uh, the answer is no. There are plenty of tools in VR that make or will make our lives better. And I just want to start with a little bit of history. Where, where does the VR come from? And uh, VR started as a military tool, a tool used for training in, in military camps, and uh, especially in the United States. And it actually started first as a flight simulator program in, in the late 1970s. They used to have virtual reality headsets with CRT displays, um, with massive cables holding up to the you know, roof so it wouldn't crush your head. And then over time, it turned into something like this, soldiers using virtual reality to train in a virtual battlefield. And actually, um, the real reason we got the VR as it is today is just a mobile revolution that made the prices of all the components necessary cheap enough. So it's important to remember VR was around for at least 40 years in, in, in this space, and we're only getting a glimpse of it in consumer space now. So what are the other uses of VR? So can uh, somebody from the audience shout out different uses for VR they can think of uh, that are not games? Education, what was it? First aid. First aid courses. What else? So, education. 
Travel. Travel. Real estate. Real estate. So, okay, I think so you basically mentioned most of the stuff I'm going to show, so <laughs> I'm going to rush through these. This is an interesting example. This is a video of a patient who has a 40% burn on his body, so third degree burns. Uh, from Iraq war and he's using this program created by University of Washington uh, these two guys made this program where you throw snowballs at penguins while your um, Plasters are being ripped off and you suffer from intense pain However, this distraction that virtual reality provides helps the patient to sustain uh, You know sustain that exercise longer and not suffer from the pain as much They even went as far as saying it's as 50% as effective as morphine um, which is a pretty strong claim. So it's a proper research done and y it's actually used in hospitals around, around the globe nowadays. So what's next for VR and medicine? So I'm going to go through these different topics and just try to reiterate what's coming next in those fields. <coughs> So curing phobias. Actually, just yesterday, BBC wrote an article about a study done in Oxford University that helps people to cope with schizophrenia and paranoia. They run through different exercises where you have to go inside a lift and, and meet people who look like strangers at first, but you pass those exercises without being harmed. And this helps people to reduce the feel of anxiety by 100% in a week's time. So just being in a different environment, being safe and training yourself, like tricking your brain you're really there, can be really useful in these cases. So um, pain relief is the one uh, example I talked about already. Then physiotherapy. Um, so physiotherapy <coughs> is uh, moving around and, and, and returning your muscles to a normal sort of state. And uh, currently, different devices like Microsoft Connect are being used for that, but virtual reality provides even more immersive um, way of, of training your body. And there are case studies where this was done after the stroke. Um, so after patients suffer stroke, they, want, they go through the um, recovery exercises, and virtual reality is now used to reinforce that learning. Uh, that visual reinforcement helps to reconnect those, you know, those connections in your brain and reinforce the, re the re rehabilitation process. Neuro neurological disorder treatments is another field that we're actually working in right now. Uh, we're in the process of uh, trying this new app in the University Hospital of Vilnius University here in Vilnius and Imperial College in London at the same time. We made an app that allows patients to, as I call it, recalibrate their heads. There's a neurological disease called uh, um, uh, it's basically a complex name, <laughs> and I only know it in Lithuania, but what it does, a, lo a lot of people get this sense of um, their head swinging around because of the impurities in their inner ear that got in there. And it can be solved by a simple exercise of moving your head around and recalibrating your head, just like you do with your phone when the compass goes off. And currently those exercises are very simple, but they take about 20 minutes to complete, uh, and you might need to repeat them for the good progress. And uh, a lot of times doctors don't have that level luxury of time in the in the reception at night. So we made a uh, VR app on the Gear VR that just lets people look at those dots and connect them in virtual reality and basically do that on their own with some help from a doctor. So hopefully we'll uh, pass the commission and get to the clinical trials and maybe this is going to be a world's first application for this field in the medical uh, VR. And then treating PTSD, so it's post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, or shell shock, as they used to call it, after the First World War. It's a, it's a stress disorder soldiers get after coming back from the war zone. And it's basically um, a fear of, of different sounds and that remind them of the battlefield. And all this can be healed and, and cured by re-going re re to back to those places, the war zones and virtual reality and retraining your brain. So this is very interesting. All these cases are being used right now in different universities and con are going to continue to be used later on. And if you want like uh, more specific examples, you can just email me. I'll send you those links. It's, it's actually fascinating. So another field is architecture. <coughs> Do we have any architects in the room? <laughs> so one half architect. <laughs> um, so architecture is, is kind of an obvious use for VR. Because if you design something and you want to try it out before you build it, it's a pretty good solution. <laughs> um, you can feel the sense of scale. You can feel the sense of distance. You can walk around in your building. You can spot different things that you build wrong. And it's just going to take over architecture, I think, in the next few years.
Um, so what's next for VR and architecture? 360 videos, of course. That's sort of being done right now. Then photogrammetric photography. It's sort of a oxymoron when you think about it, but what it is, it's just a scan of your room in the 3D uh, environment done with a li uh, light emitting radar. And what it allows you to do is to walk in your room as it was real with high quality textures. There are a few demos like that on the HTC Vive that lets you feel the environment as if it, as if it was really there. Then different kinds of VR visualizations, um, virtual architectural reviews, so imagine doing the architectural review in different teams, in different continents at the same time in the VR world. Obviously real-time first-person editing, being in a space and designing the walls where you're in there rather than looking at the plans. All these things are going to revolutionize architecture. And this is another answer of why, why VR is useful and it's just not for games. It's for everything. Training. <coughs> training is another field where VR is going to be pretty big. And when I say training, I mean training and simulation and any sort of um, um, other things. So what you're seeing right now here is a demo we built for an electrical plant as a simulation of what happens when your system gets hacked by Anonymous. And uh, it's just one example of stressful situations you can undergo to and you can just make people answer questions as you do now on the pieces of paper and, and you know it's rather um, boring when you do it uh, as a test but you can make that test interactive in virtual reality and those people will remember what they need to do because they actually been there in their mind for their mind they actually been there so what's next in training uh, disaster simulations as I just showed you you can practice meltdowns of electrical plants nuclear power stations and other things safely you can reiterate the procedures train people what to do in those procedures giving them a sufficient amount of stress but keeping them in safety <laughs> health and safety training uh, I'm not sure how popular it is in Lithuania but at least in the United Kingdom uh, it's pretty much all you do when you get the job <laughs> you have to reiterate health and safety training fire safety training and most people don't care about it they just want to go through it as quickly as possible so what this could help with is make it more interesting making it making it immersive and the third point is course. <laughs> Courses requiring 100% attention. And this is something a lot of people miss when they think about training in VR, is that when you're in virtual reality, you can't look at your phone and play games. And you can't <laughs> doodle on a piece of paper. You're basically listening to the content or just closing your eyes and still listening to the content. It's rather like a scene from the Clockwork Orange movie where your eyes are peeled open and you just get the information in, except it is definitely more pleasurable than that. So any sort of attention heavy courses are gonna benefit from this heavily. Um, same, same, same goes for first responder trainings, firefighter, policemen, training for difficult situations. So you put enough reality, enough realism in, and you can train people to, to do different things. And obviously driving simulators. So, you know, we could probably get another 40 hours on a real life kind of driving course before we do the real driving tests. Um, marketing and advertising is another field. So this is, uh, this is our demo at Build Stuff um, conference. Uh, we built a roller coaster with some, some Vilnius, famous Vilnius buildings around the course and we just showed it as most people do uh, as an intro to virtual reality for people who never tried it. But uh, apart from these roller coasters, marketing is going to get transformed by VR as well. So even today, we can see more and more 360 videos being produced and, and shown on Facebook. This is now mostly in just a, sort of a sm smartphone web format. But as we go f further, more people have VR headsets. We're going to see more and more 360 content being built. Obviously, 360 videos is sort of a lowest end, lowest de denominator for VR. It's not as immersive as, as, as full-on 3D experiences, but it's something that still brings that extra level of immersion. A few other things that are worth mentioning in the ad and marketing space is obviously um, using VR for events, pro as product extensions, just like Coca-Cola recently did, and building empathy with your user. So you can allow your user to feel what you want them to feel, be somewhere else, transform their experience like they were in somebody else's shoes. And it's a powerful tool for any ad or marketing agency. And we've been helping some of them here as well to transform the content just right so they can engage their users in the most effective way possible. 
and the enterprise market. So I think this is the market most people don't talk about. And the demo you're seeing now on the screen is from Epic Games. This is a real life editor in Unreal Engine 4. So this allows you to edit the scene in VR. So when you're designing for VR, you want to kind of feel the scene in VR, and this is what it allows you to do. But this is a good example of what's going to be possible in 3D Max, AutoCAD, and probably most other 3D softwares in the near future. Because if you have the benefit of feeling something at scale, this is probably something you can use. Obviously, if you're designing 2D things, this is might, might be not for you, but in many cases, this, this is going to be quite useful. So looking... <coughs> Uh, the enterprise market, um, these are a few things I think are going to be pretty big. So 3D editing, as I mentioned, better information management. This is something uh, we have a long sort of history on working on, but I don't think anyone has solved it yet. When we think about the folders and Dropbox and other, you know, file systems that we use to sort our data, they're usually messy, and they're usually impossible to find things in because we don't think in tree structures. We're, we're not computers. We don't parse trees. What we do, we remember where we put things. Or we don't remember, but we most, most of the time we do remember where we put things. And I think organizing your projects and organizing your data in the 3D space actually makes more sense than it sounds at first because you will be able to use your geospatial uh, orientation to find things, find documents, files, and other things you can, you can look at. So data visualization. I think VR is great for that too, and we're going to see more and more things happening in this space. First of all, <laughs> we don't have to do exponential scales anymore. When you're, when you're drawing a graph, you can show it as big as it is in VR, and you can give that real sense of scale for the people looking at that graph. If you want to compare a billion to 10,000, it's easy to do. You just show it as, it's full, as, as it is in the full scale, and you can really co communicate that sense of scale. Better communication tools and better project management tools. I think those two are going to be pretty big markets. I don't know how many of you worked in large projects with remote teams, but it's usually a huge pain in the butt. <laughs> and you, you have to communicate with 20 people who are not in your country, and you have to do it uh, all together at the same time. And I think virtual project management rooms, uh, virtual Gantt charts and things, you can all like places you can all meet in and solve these problems, they're going to be huge. We might have to wait for additional five years, but I think the future is really here. And obviously, virtual showrooms for products and other things. So these are definitely the categories you should look at. To, so to sum up, these are probably the most um, plausible sort of areas where VR is going to be really big quite soon. Obviously, there are many other ones that I haven't mentioned here. And basically, almost any area we have now can benefit from some sorts of VR. This doesn't mean that VR will take over or take away our smartphones. I think it's just going to be a part of a bigger picture of the systems that we use. But since this is uh, more about games, I guess you're all asking, but what about games? So I'm going to talk about games now. And uh, games are the sort of the main use for VR these days. When we think about VR and the content we have there, more than 50% of it is just gaming or entertainment or adult entertainment. But uh, most of it is still games. And uh, so what's next for gaming? Are, have we figured it out? Are we out of the woods yet? And the question for that is possibly no. So what's the current state of the gaming in VR? And I think this picture represents this very, very well, this old TV. I think this is where we are at VR. We're at the beginning of the television, except we're at the beginning of VR gaming. We're trying to copy what we have seen before, as we did with the theater in television. We're trying to make something that looks similar and familiar to us, but we have to let it go and think about new things. So I'm going to split this in two because there are really two tiers of VR nowadays. There's mobile VR and there's desktop VR. They're, they're very different in their capabilities. And as a result, they're very different in how do you want to shape those experiences. So for mobile VR these days, it's mainly these two products. It's either one, or f one form or another of a Google Cardboard. So <coughs> it can be a Google Plastic, a Chinese Plastic, Google Cardboard, or something else. Something you put your phone in. Or it's a Samsung Gear VR, which is a more advanced version of that, having its own sensors and control panel on the side. But the fact remains, it's ma ma mainly driven by a smartphone. 
So if, if we look at how mobile VR games look, they bring us back to the good old days of 2000, <laughs> when the games had about 50,000 polygons in their scenes. They were challenged by any sort of graphical issues. I have to notice some of this footage in their ad is actually from the Oculus games, not from the Gear VR games. So they look a bit worse than the Gear VR. Um, but the, the thing is, we're pushing everything we can out of that mobile processor, and we are very, very limited by what it can do. I mean, those challenges are, can, you know, it can be the whole another talk about the challenges that you have to undergo just to design for mobile gaming and mobile VR. And what it mostly allows us to do without the positional tracking is to look around, see the immersive content, interact with it, but things like locomotion and other things aren't solved yet. When we look at the desktop, we have these three contestants occupying the market space right now. <coughs> HTC Vive and Oculus Rift just launched. PlayStation VR is waiting till October to take over the game. But um, these are the three main devices you kind of need to know if you're thinking about desktop VR. They're not the same, and Oculus Rift and PlayStation VR are seated experiences. They might have controllers for your hands, or you might be able to stand up, but they're designed to be played and used from a seated experience, from your chair, from a swivel chair that you can turn around on, but mostly from a stationary point. And this is great, because most people don't own you know, uh, empty rooms just for their VR sets. And uh, this allows anyone to use their VR headset with their current system. However, it limits you. It limits you in a way you can design games. It causes some locomotion sickness problems when you're moving and your physical body isn't moving. But again, this is just the beginning of VR gaming. And then we have room scale. This is probably a video you have seen in this conference already. This is just from an HTC Vive introduction. This is a completely um, different VR experience because you can walk around. So you have your little space which is tracked and you have two hand controllers that allows you to interact with the objects and allows you to walk around with your own body and be tracked in virtual reality. So this is, this is something that most headsets will probably move towards at some point. But because it's still very early days, this is co currently the only one which can do that. Yeah, this is actually, once you try it, I would say at least personally, it's, it's a, at least a 10 times as impressive as the other headsets because of the freedom it gives you. So what's behind all this and what do we have to do? And we have to think about new game mechanics because everything we know already is kind of pointless like Counter-Strike and Half-Life and all the FPS shooters are great on the screen, but they, they kind of make you want to warm it in VR. They're too fast, they're, um, they're too quick, and, and they just don't provide that sense of control that you need. And also, if you bump into objects and you're not moving, it makes you unease. So I just wanted to talk about few in my opinion, very, exper very important experiences and very important points for VR game design. And I think things like asymmetric experiences, and by that I mean being in the same game from two different platforms, or maybe from a Gear VR as a main player, and from, uh, sorry, uh, the HTC Vive as a main player, and with Gear VR so as a secondary player, or having a tablet or a phone and interacting and spawning enemies at somebody who's using a headset is going to be a way forward. Until we see a worldwide adaptation of VR headsets, we're not going to have enough of them to have full-on multiplayers and, and you know, traditional gaming sort of th things where you, you, you know, where you have symmetrical system, where you have the same device. So I think thinking in asymmetric ways is a very good way to start. And actually, a lot of good games like Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes are best examples because they are asymmetric experiences, because they allow multiple people to experience VR in different forms and share it. I think physical exercise gaming is another interesting point. And I haven't really got it until I got the Vive. And once I tried the Vive and I used it for a couple of hours, I felt knackered. I felt tired as if I was, as if 
I was exercising. And when you think about it, you actually are exercising in VR because you have to move around, you keep your hands up all the time, you have to avoid bullets shooting at you. You get the same level of stress as you do when you're playing you know, basketball or football. So I think physical exercise gaming is going to be a big thing in, in at least room-tracked you know, room VR devices. So there's one thing to look at. Social experiences. Most people say that VR is unsocial and it's totally not true. VR is super social because it's so intense, you want to share it with others. It's something you experience and you want to share it with others, show it to others, and you actually want to take a break while others try it because you're tired. And it's a great opportunity for others to spectate your game and see what you're doing in the game and experience it from a different angle. And as I said at the bottom here, I think streaming and spectating are going to be even more important in VR gaming as they are today. This is going to be a completely new era of sports, I think. Esports. But in sports in a true sense. Not sports by clicking your mouse, but sports by having a skill and a strategy and a physical skill to execute that. So I think that these whole things together are going to form very good foundations for good VR games. But we're yet to see those things being developed and used. And we're currently at the state where we are basically walking the first baby steps to getting anything done. There are about 12 good games for the HTC Vive and there's about the same for the Oculus. We're basically in 1996 for the internet, <laughs> except it's 2016 and we're starting VR. So just before I end, one more thing is, what comes after VR? Many people ask me about augmented reality and other things, and at least my point and my take on it is that AR is the evolution of VR. AR is where we're going, and VR where we are currently now. And this is just an example a video from Microsoft showing off their HoloLens and a sort of a Skype call of the future. So one of those people uh, here, He's in another room, uh, but he's being sort of shown to the other person on the display. So you could be in your own room, somebody else who's remotely somewhere across the world. And you can record these memories and remember them and replay them later. So it's something that's going to transform us, a species, even more possibly. But we can't really stipulate on that yet, because we're nowhere near perfection in these systems. <laughs> the HoloLens shown here can bar barely power itself. It works for about 30 minutes be before it discharges. Its field of view is tiny and equal to a CD case in front of your face. But it's a start. It's a start to the further revolution where we're moving. And I think once we get computers good enough that can power VR, once we get them better enough that can do good high quality VR, then we can move into AR and explore all these different possibilities of things. So I would say we're still at least five years away from anything meaningful in AR, but it's definitely the future we're moving towards. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll wait for your questions if you have any. Um, if, if you have any questions from the back, uh, you can use the microphone here. Um, in, in front. Uh, what's the sure. field uh, that the rest of labs is working on? Okay, so the question was, what's the current field the rest of labs is working on? So the answer is, um, I'm trying to grow this VR field by investing my own funds into it and get, gathering the community around it. Currently, we have two apps in the pipeline. As I mentioned, the medical one, we did one open source art project with a couple of artists. Uh, we're going to hopefully release it soon. But we're, we're focusing mainly on uh, non-games, I would say. Games are interesting, but it's a completely sp specialist market. So I guess that's the answer. <coughs> Okay, so the question was, what's the VR relation to bring computer interfaces? So I actually designed a few demos for the EEG headsets in VR. I mean, I, I think in the long run, that might be an option. Currently, most brain interfaces are sort of gimmicky, let's put, you know, to put it at least. We can scan the concentration levels and meditation levels of a person, but it's not something we can rely on in the long term. Um, I think one thing that's going to come soon in this going to be rather important is eye tracking. 
So eye tracking is going to be important because of rendering optimizations and other things. Sorry. Yeah, I think it, it's more of a fundamental question if it can be developed without putting wires into our brains. Or, because if we're listening from outside the box, it's really hard to, to make meaningful discussions about what's going in there. Unless we do, uh, you know, unless we move into machine learning good at, well enough so we can actually predict more meaningful data out of EEGs. But I'm quite skeptical about that. Any more? Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Oh no, one more question. Oh, you can you can catch you can catch others uh, uh, later here in the conference.